This is CBC Here and Now. A complaint against the NLC sparked a nepotism review. There were no rules broken, but you know, any objective person looking at this would have concern. He went to Mount Cashel, but was sexually battered by a social worker. The very person that was supposed to protect him uh, abused him. Now the province accepts responsibility. People are asking the question more now than ever before. And that question is, how can I possibly survive the coming jump in electricity rates? A big temperature rise on the way over the next couple of days, but heavy rain on the menu, and as the cold air pushes back, snow, ice pellets, and the chance for significant freezing rain as well. The, the breakdown is coming up. CBC News has learned that a complaint filed against the Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Corporation last year sparked a government-wide review of anti-nepotism rules. A wine distributor alleged that he was losing business because the NLC started to buy products from a company that was linked to the son of then-CEO Steve Winter. Winter was terminated last Friday. Here are now's Fred Hutton picks up the story. Fred. Well, Anthony, last year, wine distributor Boyd Goodyear filed a complaint against the NLC with the province's citizens representative. CBC News has obtained a copy of that report. Now, in it, Barry Fleming, who's the citizens representative, says that Goodyear, claim, who claimed to have about 30 years of experience with Bordeaux wines and was an expert, started losing business back in 2012 to Winter's son and a friend of Winter who got into the wine distribution business about a decade ago. Now, we want to be clear. Uh, Steve Winter did nothing wrong here. There were no rules broken, but it's essentially because the, there were no rules broken. That's why the provincial government decided to take a closer look at the entire matter and have a full scale review of anti nepotism rules. I was shocked. Steve Winter may be gone from the NLC, but there are still a lot of unanswered questions about what caused his sudden dismissal. Winter told us earlier this week that his relationship with the CFO, Sharon Sparks, was, at best, strained. After he fired her, she was not only rehired by government, but replaced Winter as the CEO, a position he held for 14 years. Finance Minister Tom Osborne told the CBC the change was prompted in part by government's desire to put someone at the helm who would cut costs and was comfortable with the corporation's role in regulating marijuana sales. Now, details of an investigation from 2017 about allegations of nepotism and conflict of interest involving Winter have come to light. The report did point out that Steve Winter disclosed his son's connection to the wine business to the NLC's board of directors and that the board did not see a problem. Finance Minister Tom Osborne says while no rules were broken, something like this won't be permitted down the road. The citizens' representative did identify that, uh, you know, because there's no policy in place, there were no rules broken, uh, but, uh, you know, any uh, objective person looking at this would have concerns. The complaint also pointed to the NLC making it increasingly difficult for Goodyear to bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars of wine for his private customers. But the NLC said the way he was doing it was too complicated and it was creating more work than the NLC staff could handle. In the end, the citizens' representative sided with the NLC on that aspect of the complaint. As for the conflict, there was no breach because the rules don't cover such a situation related to a parent and an adult child. So now Cabinet is drafting new rules that will apply across the board. All right, so Fred, where does all of this sit right now? Well, right now it's at the Cabinet table. Anthony, Tom Osborne says uh, they want to get those new rules in place as soon as possible, and we may hear something uh, very soon about it. He says not just for the NLC, but right across the board, all agencies, boards, and commissions. And Fred, finally, what about Steve Winter now? What does he say about all this? Well, I spoke with him uh, late this afternoon, and he said to me that uh, he was never asked to contribute to the citizens' representative uh, report in this. He was he he'd had no input into it whatsoever, but he did say that the details in there are incomplete and they paint a distorted picture. He also wanted to uh, stress that he at no point had any direct contact in purchasing wine from either his son or his friend. That was done at a marketing level. Anthony? 
That's uh, our Fred Hutton reporting live from our newsroom. Now, in other stories, tragedy on our highways tonight. A man working as a flag person during brush clearing operations has died after a pickup truck struck him. It happened this morning on Route 80 in an area between Hearts Content and New Perlican. The man is in his early 50s and was rushed to hospital where he later died of his injuries. The pickup truck driver wasn't injured. There's no decision yet on possible charges and the accident closed the highway for about seven hours. Tonight from CBC Investigates, a tragic tale. Three decades ago, a teenager at Mount Cashel escaped sexual abuse at the hands of the Christian brothers, only to face it outside the orphanage by a person who was supposed to protect him. Now the government has finally accepted liability for what happened. Here now is Jen White has the details. It makes me very angry. Lawyer Lynn Moore represents John Doe. 30 years ago, he was placed in the province's custody. In 1986, he was living with his mother when child protection officials decided he should move to Mount Cashel. John Doe was reluctant, and that's when a social worker stepped in. The social worker pretended uh, that he was assisting with the, the move to Mount Cashel and would take him for drives and talk to him and counsel him and um, do what social workers were expected to do, except that, um, you know, our belief is that he was grooming him um, for the eventual sexual exploitation which took place. These court documents tell the story. Under the guise of getting something at his home, the social worker lured John Doe to his basement apartment. He plied the teenager with alcohol and repeatedly sexually battered him. The very person that was supposed to protect him abused him in a horrible uh, fashion. It's terrible to me that the government did not recognize this problem earlier and deal with it. The social worker was fired from his job in 1988 for the misappropriation of funds. Moore says he diverted government money to another young man. The documents also mention serious performance issues prior to the social worker's dismissal. There is evidence to suggest that the social worker's supervisor was concerned that the social worker was sexually abusing children. It's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. This is a particularly serious one that involved, you know, pretty, pretty serious uh, fact pattern. Last month, the province admitted liability in the case. The government will pay John Doe $750,000. It's one of the highest settlements ever paid out by the province related to an abuse case. This is a person's life that was irreparably damaged and, and government admitted liability. Uh, it is a significant amount. The social worker has since died. Moore says John Doe is now in his 40s. He has suffered from PTSD, depression, and social anxiety. My client is an exceptionally resilient individual, and uh, he is uh, trying to move on with his life. And uh, despite you know the significant impact that this has had, um, he is. Uh, having dealt with it now, he's picking up the pieces and, and moving on. Lynn Moore says it's important for her clients in these types of cases that they get the acknowledgement from government in settling. She says it's a form of validation that they've been harmed and that the province accepts the blame. Jen White, CBC News, St. John's. Now that settlement that Jen reported on is another small chapter in the grim history of sexual abuse in this province. Much of that came to light around the story of Mount Cashel. Victims continue to suffer from the trauma that the Christian brothers inflicted on them. And some of them are still waiting to find closure in the court system. Here now is Carolyn Stokes has that story. This place where people buy their groceries was where one of the darkest chapters in this province's history played out. A sexual abuse scandal that shocked people everywhere. Now this monument, the only hint of what happened. Back in the 1950s, this is where the provincial government began placing young boys into the care of the Christian brothers. But it wouldn't be until 1989 when the public would come to understand the severity of the decades-long physical, sexual and emotional abuse endured by those children. The anger and outcry resulted in a judicial inquiry. The Hughes Commission began in St. John's. And if you want to get a sense of just how big the Hughes inquiry was, just have a look in here. This room here at CBC contains only videotapes of the Hughes inquiry. Two years worth of testimony, witness after witness, revealing the true extent of the abuse and the cover-ups by police, by government, by clergy and by media.
Within the next few years, nine Christian brothers were convicted for physical and sexual abuse. Then, in 1992, the orphanage is demolished. The building gone, but the damage already done. The lawsuits ensued. The Christian brothers went bankrupt, so many victims turned to the province for compensation. To date, the provincial government has settled with 132 victims at a cost of $30.6 million. And it's not over yet. Government still faces 19 civil suits. So it may be many years before it's all settled, but will there be a day the book can finally be closed on Mount Cashel? Lawyer Will Hiscock believes the legacy will last generations. The reality is, is that this has a real impact on, on not just the individual, but on their families. And uh, we will be feeling the impact of what those children lived through forever. So people will continue to drive on by this subtle reminder of a piece of history that's difficult to remember, but harder to forget. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. There is a warning tonight prompted by recent wolf sightings in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Wolves have been reported in the east end of Happy Valley Goose Bay over the last few months. Officials believe the wild animals are being drawn to the area by garbage and unsecured food. The dumping of garbage is only allowed at designated waste disposal sites. Pet owners are urged to protect their animals by keeping them in a fenced yard or under close supervision. Hmm. I was looking at seeing all that, uh, you know, the wolves, and you don't want them to get the human contact and all that, but what I noticed is the snow, yeah. the levels of snow there. Yeah. So for people who like to snowshoe, as does Ms. Cooper, I send you an assignment to Labrador, I guess. Okay, <laughs> That's right. okay, we'll talk about <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, uh, because on the island, the snow is going to take a big hit from Corner Brook right through Central, especially here in eastern Newfoundland, where we're talking about double digits both days this weekend, even tomorrow. Wow. Temperatures are going to be very mild. Have a look. Uh, there's a lot on this map, so I'm going to let you uh, soak it in. Uh, in the east, it's showers that we really have to contend with over the next 48 hours. The rain doesn't get here till Sunday. Uh, that rain at times heavy, certainly. Uh, for central Newfoundland, rain will turn to freezing rain, but not until we roll into the Saturday night, Sunday time period. And the bulk of that freezing rain and the bulk of the precip will have moved to the north by then. The freezing rain, significant risk for the north coast. Humber Valley, Bayvert Peninsula, southern sections of the northern peninsula. It's the southwest coast and the west coast that get into that heavy rain through the day tomorrow, but mainly for Friday night and through Saturday. And so really looking at the potential for more than 50 millimeters in some spots there. Uh, snow for the Northern Peninsula, Southeastern Labrador could be significant. And for Labrador City, Happy Valley Goose Bay and most of Southern Labrador, above freezing temperatures tomorrow, and then the bottom just drops right out. We are talking about dropping into the minus 20s and 30s by Saturday morning into the afternoon. So a huge temperature drop on the other side of this front as it slides from west to east. We'll break down your timeline in full detail with the next three days coming up in just a few minutes. Anthony. Thanks, Ryan. The newly named mayor of Happy Valley Goose Bay says better drinking water may be on the way. It became official last night when Mayor Wally Anderson was voted to replace John Hickey, who died last month after a hunting accident. Well, last week, MP Von Jones said Goose Bay may get more access to Spring Gulch. That's the water that supplies Five Wing Goose Bay and is believed to be better than the municipal supply. A 2016 study showed that town water had higher levels of cancer-causing chemicals and was more corrosive. If we can get the water from Spring Gulch, uh, this will be one of the biggest achievements I think that any council could do. When you, when you can turn around and provide the town of Happy Valley with better quality drinking water, uh, that would be a major, major, major accomplishment. The provincial NDP released more details about its 2018 leadership convention. The event will take place in St. John's April 6th to the 8th. The deadline for candidates to register is February 28th, and it'll cost you $2,000 to do so. All party members signed up by March 7th will be able to vote in the contest. The next provincial election is in 2019. Uh, relationships, health, personal care, and alcohol and tobacco are all flexible. You can find ways to cut within these categories. Doing the math, how to stretch your budget as electricity rates are set to soar.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, a local credit counselor says all the talk this week of a potential 23% hike in electricity rates on the island is sending shivers through consumers. Al Antle says so many people are struggling with their finances now, and that kind of rate hike would be hard to handle. Earlier this week, consumer advocate Dennis Brown raised concerns about Hydro's application to the PUB for a rate hike, which he claims will be about 23 percent. Higher electricity costs, especially as Muskrat Falls looms, are top of mind for many these days. Here's the breakdown from Hydro of current electricity costs. The average household on the island pays $174 a month for electricity. For those with electric heat, that number is higher, about $230 a month. Those who don't use electric heat, their bill comes in at nearly $97. These costs are before HST. Nowcore says island rates will almost double in 2021 once Muskrat Falls is underway. Prices will soar from $0.11 cents a kilowatt hour to $0.22. Cents. So Al Antle, where are people going to come up with $230 extra a month? They're going to trim their existing revenue. They're not going to cut. In fact, cutting is essentially off the table in practical terms. Let's just talk about a typical ideal household from a budgeting perspective. The house we live in, the place we call home, the place we raise our families, the shelter cost for said house should not take more than 33% of your take home pay. The food costs in that household, no more than 18%. The transportation and mobility, no more than 15%. The relationships, yes, we it costs us to be a family, uh, should take no more than 15% of our take home pay. Health and personal care, no more than 4%. Yes, this reflects the fact that we are living in a state sponsored, fundamentally healthcare system, and 7% of our take-home pay should be spent on what I call vices, but it gets me in trouble when I do, so we'll call them alcohol and tobacco. Now, this one here, shelter, is essentially inflexible. If you think about what fits in there, this is where your mortgage payment, your rent payment, your taxes, uh, your insurance, uh, utilities, so on and so forth. Most of these are inflexible. They're set, they're fixed, you're, you're, you're stuck with what you're stuck with. This one here, food, clothing, transportation, mobility, uh, relationships, health, personal care, and alcohol and tobacco are all flexible. You can find ways to cut within these categories. So just by way of example, to find that $233, if you could somehow, and, I, and then you, depending on the income, if you could somehow find, say, $30 a month from your food budget, then if you could trim clothing costs, say, by $25 a month, then possibly could you trim transportation and mobility by $40 a month. Uh, can you cut down on your relationship expenses, i.e. less entertainment? No going to the movies as often, well, or eating out, as or often. buying. The key piece being as often. Yes, because you made the point, not cut Don't completely. Cut. Don't cut. Why not? Be it's not reasonable. I'm, I'm, let me ask you, could you not go to a movie for the next 365 days? Mm. Probably not. But you could probably go 11 times next year instead of 12. Yeah. Get my point? So you can go through these flexible categories and you think with Look hard for bits work and pieces. you could come up with and some with savings. resourcefulness. Now, the next piece to keep in mind as well is this is an ideal opportunity for us to look inside our households for efficiencies. What can we do to cut the cost of hydro generally? Like wear a sweater, mm. like turn off lights, like, you know, do things that just don't require the payment for that particular service. The people that you hear from, um, are they voicing a lot of concern? News yeah. this week yeah. that uh, it could be a rate yeah. application uh, for a 23% yeah. increase just within the next year. Mm -hmm. Is this on people's minds? We started to hear this around late September, early October. However, in the last few days since this hit the media, people are asking the question more now than ever before. You know, this is a, this is a question for somebody who makes $15,000 a year, and it's a question for somebody who makes, you know, $300,000 a year. And I guess they can't wait to see what's going to happen down the road when Muskrat Falls mm -hmm. comes on stream, can they? That's, that's without question what's driving most of the concern. But there is a silver lining. 
we have three years notice. This is not happening tomorrow. So we have time to look, see what can we do as households to make sure that when this comes, it doesn't devastate us. Failure to plan will get us in trouble, I promise. Bit of tough love needed for this plan, absolutely, though. Absolutely, absolutely tough love. However, it is doable. Al Antle, thank you so much. My pleasure, always. You know, Anthony Al says this looming increase in uh, electricity rates is the biggest financial uh, challenge he has seen in yeah, years. No, a lot of uh, a lot of concern out there. How cold is it? Perhaps cold enough to crack windows in Ontario. It's always a good way to stay warm these days, and one of the ways to do that is just to run to the desk, <laughs> and there we have it, a little calisthenics. Getting the very latest information. <laughs> Absolutely. Please, please, turn on, turn on uh, my computer. Uh, a little lag, but it's, it's there now and ready to You're go. You're working it too hard. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It doesn't know what to do with all those colors that are lighting up the map. So right now, why don't we start with the warnings, because okay. we do have some for the West Coast, and I know you folks at Marble Mountain see this, and... Yeah, shudder. Rainfall warnings are in effect for Bay St. George, Corner Brook, Gross Morn, 
and up into the Daniels Harbor region. Special weather statements are in effect across the island and into southeastern parts of Labrador. Significant snow melt for all. Now, this system, in case you missed it, is going to bring a little bit of everything to the province. The snow, the ice, and the rain across Labrador with big temperature drops on the way here. The significant freezing rain threat for the Baver Peninsula, the north coast down into the Humber Valley. Heavy rain for the west coast and southwest coast of the island. We will see some freezing rain, but it starts as rain for uh, central parts of Newfoundland. Showers for the most part across eastern parts of the island, uh, but it won't be a significant rain until Sunday. And the south coast uh, of the southeast coast, the Buren, southern Avalon could get into some of that heavier rain on Sunday. Uh, so we'll uh, break it all down with your forecast right now. Here is the low and a huge temperature contrast on the other side of this front. 10 degrees, double digits in southern Ontario, minus 16 in Thunder Bay. Is that a front or what? So we're going to be seeing the warm air pushing up ahead of this system and then a big temperature drop on the other side as it slides through. And of course, between is where we'll see our most unsettled weather, the snow, the freezing rain, the ice pellets and the steadiest rainfall. Here is a look at your temperatures and watch as we roll throughout the overnight temperatures are on the rise. We'll be at three or four degrees by the time most of us wake up tomorrow morning. Do watch for some fog patches uh, driving in some patchy drizzle along the eastern parts, including the Avalon Peninsula and better chance of showers along the west coast. Winds will gust 60 to 70 kilometers per hour. We'll be at plus four to start the day in western Labrador. We will not finish there uh, as we see the rain mix back to snow there. Happy Valley Goose Bay will go from snow to rain and as will southeastern parts of Labrador. Watch along the west coast getting into some of those steadier periods of rain through the afternoon, especially into the evening. I think this model overcooking temperatures by just a little bit. Uh, with the snowpack on the ground, thinking we'll get to around six, seven degrees, maybe some eight degree temps across the island for tomorrow. And again, temperatures dropping through western parts of Labrador as we go back to snow and we'll be all the way down by Saturday morning, back down to into the minus 25 or 26 range in Lab City. Happy Valley Goose Bay into the minus 20 range by Saturday morning as well. Note the rain across the island, some gusty winds, and there is that freezing rain threat for Saturday late afternoon into the evening hours, mainly the north coast, the Bay Verde Peninsula towards southern sections of the northern peninsula. The threat, though, does dip into central for Saturday evening into the overnight, so keep that in mind. Through the afternoon, though, we're at double digit potential from St. John's to Cornerbrook, minus 15 to 25 on the other side of this front through uh, Labrador. And again, significant snow potential here for the southeast and northern peninsula. There's your timeline as we roll into the Sunday time period. I do think temperatures drop through central patchy freezing drizzle, some flurries on the menu. Uh, so most of the heaviest precips gone by the time we're into the freezing rain threat, primarily for central. Sunday looks like a wet day in eastern parts of Newfoundland, double digits and those periods of rain. And again, a bit of a messy mix through central, the light precip and uh, we're clearing out, but certainly cooling down across the big land, minus 22 to minus 30 for highs on the other side of this front. Only in Newfoundland, 10 minus 30. We'll have a look at your long range forecast coming up in a few minutes. Lots of contrast in the weather, and as uh, Ryan uh, just told us all, this cold snap should end well, at least for a little while. But in other places in the country, blasts of unusually cold weather have been causing all kinds of problems, from power outages to burst pipes and lots of other things, too. And in one Ottawa neighborhood, some people wonder if freezing temperatures are cracking the windows in their newly built homes. Here's Stu Mills. Mikko Forty is still getting used to his brand new house on Remora Way. The family just moved in last February, so the weather last month was some of the coldest they or their house have ever seen. I think it was um, right after we had that minus 35 temperature outside. That's when Forty noticed a crack in his dream home. We opened up the drapes to let some light in. We noticed the crack in the window. It's not a small one either but he thinks there's a simple explanation. It was really cold outside. New build, of course, there's lots of adjustments happening with the framing of the house. On a Facebook page for residents in this Half Moon Bay neighborhood, more cracks begin to appear. Another Barhaven neighbor who doesn't want to go on camera says he too had a broken window, which he took to the builder, Madame Holmes. But not everybody agrees that cold weather is the cause of Barhaven's window pane. There has to be a reason for every, for every problem, there's a, there's a reason behind it. I say windows shouldn't crack. 
Neil Card has been a builder and now a building inspector for decades. Cold weather thing to do with it otherwise. I mean, I've lived in northern Alberta and Winnipeg. Uh, if, if that was the case, then windows would be cracking everywhere. <laughs> Card says he suspects carpenters didn't leave enough space between the window and the frame to allow for winter contraction. So when the temperature drops, the frame shrinks and clamps down on the window casing like a vice. It goes back to whoever installed the windows. Madame Holmes says they're talking to Geldwin, the company who makes the windows. We're working with our suppliers of the windows to expedite any claims made from our customers and to get the inserts of the glass swapped out as quickly as possible. Mikkel Forty says he'll be one of those customers expecting new glass in the next few weeks. In the meantime, with another cold snap on the way, he's hoping he doesn't discover any more surprises. Stu Mill, CBC News, Ottawa. This is such a big deal. You know, this is something that we've been striving for for such a long time. They're young, they're good, and they'll be hurrying hard at the Canadian Junior Curling Championships. He's an ordinary guy with a high-end habit. Vernon Smith, the collector of classic cars. If it's not original, it's not here. <laughs> Sunday at 12.30 and Monday at 7. And welcome back to Here and Now. I love this story. Newfoundland and Labrador is sending some fresh faces to the Canadian Junior Curling Championships this week. Team Glynn out of the Remax Centre in St. John's won the right to compete at the big national level. Now the event is for curlers under the age of 21, but Team Glynn is made up of three 17-year-olds and a 15-year-old, making them one of the youngest teams in the competition. Mackenzie Glenn and I'm the skip of Team Newfoundland and Labrador. Yes, it's our first time going to the under 21s. Last year in April, we attended the very first under 18 nationals, but this is our first time stepping up to the juniors. It's really the first big step towards the Scotties, especially for women curlers. It's when you get your names out there and really show people your skill and hopefully get some more sponsors, get some people to notice you a bit more. <laughs> Hi, my name is Katie Follett, and I'm the third on Team Newfoundland and Labrador. 
This is such a big deal. You know, this is something that we've been striving for for such a long time. Going to under 18 nationals last year was a big deal again, but this one is just an even bigger deal to us, you know. It's a goal that we've had for a really long time, and we're so excited to represent our province and hopefully to do it well. Hi, I'm Sarah Chater and I'm the second for Team Newfoundland and Labrador. We competed against four other teams from across the province in uh, Gander uh, back in mid-December. We went five and one in the round robin and went straight to the final and won the final and here we are. My mom actually went to the Canadian Juniors back in 1992. Of course she put me in curling when I was little and I just loved it and stuck with it and here I am following in her footsteps Heart. I guess. <laughs> Heart. Hello, my name is Camille Burt and I'm lead for Team Newfoundland and Labrador. You know, it's a lot happening at once. It is a quick transition from winning provincials, like only a few weeks later leaving now, but it's really exciting. It really is a good experience and I think we're going to turn all of this into motivation to do good and to represent the province really well. I don't feel there's a lot of pressure. It's just we're going up there hoping to do well. We're not going up there with the idea of we have to win. It's we take it one game at a time and see where that gets us. So bright and keen. I know. But Great attitude and they're going to have a great experience. Absolutely. I think if I added up the age of each girl, it'd still be younger than the broom that I've got. I mean, <laughs> young, but anyway, good luck. <laughs> yes. And by the way... All I'm seeing these days is flu, flu, flu. There's so much flu. We'll tell you how bad it is here and if it's worth getting that flu vaccine. Welcome back to Here and Now. So before the break, we were talking about the Canadian Junior Curling Championships. We met our girls team. Fantastic. Not just the women who are going to this national competition. No, that's enough. right. There are uh, the boys, under 21 boys, and they'll be represented by a team uh, out of Cornerbrook. So a bit of sharing the curling joy across mm -hmm. the island. 
And those members from the Cornerbrook Curling Club include Daniel Bruce, Ryan McNeil La Lambswood, Andrew Bruce, and Nathan King. So uh, good luck to the guys, too. Absolutely. And still with the sports theme, let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Lillian White of Gander. <laughs> she's four and loves ballet. Right. Dressing up like Debbie Cooper. Uh, <laughs> she's been dancing since she was three years old with the Gander Dance Studio, and Lillian also enjoys swimming. I think that was your outfit last night on the show, wasn't it, Debbie? Uh, congratulations, Lillian. You're today's young athlete of the day. That's great. What a gorgeous outfit. <laughs> Cute nice. child. Uh, and it's almost as colorful as, as, as your, your map. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Almost. Yeah. Uh, you, but I, we should tell the audience, too, that uh, not only have we got a mess on our hands, you are doing double duty because you're doing the weather for our colleagues yeah. on the mainland. That's, That's true. right. Yeah. I, was giving, I was giving Ryan the gears if you missed it earlier because he ran in to get here, but he's, he's trying to do the weather for New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, and us. And yeah, uh, Atlantic Tonight, uh, tonight with uh, Amy Smith, uh, so uh, you can tune in for that. I'll have your complete Atlantic uh, forecast. Uh, and they are, again, as you said, getting the messy mix as well, New Brunswick into the freezing rain. For us, uh, some of the headlines, again, in case you... Uh, uh, missed it. The freezing rain threat best chance is going to be for the southern northern peninsula, the Bayvert Peninsula and the Bay of Exploits into the Humber Valley and Central as we roll into the Saturday night time period. Heavy rain. The best threat is for western parts of Newfoundland and the southwest coast uh, for Friday night into Saturday. The warm up for eastern parts of Newfoundland uh, double digits likely both Saturday and Sunday. Steadier rains set for Sunday and Labrador. Your temps are going to tumble from plus side temperatures Friday into the minus 20s and 30s on the other side of this front as you go from the snow to rain back to snow as this slides through. There's that significant fr uh, freezing rain threat area for northwestern sections of the island. The heavy rain for the west and southwest. Some freezing rain for central, but it appears uh, that it will be mostly rain for you folks and southeastern parts of the island again into the double digits for both Saturday and Sunday. Perhaps not right along the south coast in those onshore winds, but certainly for the metro region and the Avalon looking very likely. Even some double digits for Saturday, Cornerbrook and central parts of Newfoundland. Temps again really sliding into the Sunday time period, especially in Labrador from plus four to minus 30 in a couple of days there uh, for you folks in the west. Your timeline again, it appears we will see that snow really ramping up for northern sections happy uh, for uh, Labrador City rather it's from rain back to snow by the time we get to the Friday afternoon time period snow to rain for Goose Bay and then the coast of Newfoundland into some of those heavier periods of rain through Friday night into Saturday there's the freezing rain which will march southeastward as the cold air pushes back Saturday afternoon into Saturday evening into the overnight but again most of the heaviest precip amount uh, precip rates and the heaviest rainfall starts to taper off by the time that cold air does move in, though it will be pushing into eastern Newfoundland with some of those heavier rains on Sunday. What happens beyond that? And I was showing Debbie the forecast models today. Of course, we sit side by side and uh, she's a snow lover and I said, hey, get a load of this. So, of course, we've got the cold air coming back for a time. There is the potential for some snow as we roll into the Monday night, Tuesday time period, especially central west, maybe another mix for the Avalon. But forecast models are on board for yet another warm up, uh, both in agreement right now, both, both uh, the Euro and the American model that we'll see in yet another push of warm air for the Wednesday into Thursday time period of next week. So uh, you snow lovers, uh, not good news here. And as we take a look, uh, there's a lot of temperatures that should not be for this time of year. Your normals are on the left there below each region, St. John's Central, Western Newfoundland. We should be minus one to minus three this time of year. We're nowhere near that over the next seven days. Now for uh, Central, or Happy Valley Goose Bay and uh, Central Labrador and towards the west, the exact opposite. The cold is on. I'll have another update, of course, uh, 24 hours from now. Well, thanks, Ryan. Well, we're seeing it in our workplace, and if you're watching this week, you saw poor Zach Gowdy, our colleague, sniffling his way in a pharmacy mm -hmm. trying to get some tips. Maybe you're seeing it in your workplace, too, people fighting off some kind of cold or a flu bug. Eastern Health says that as of the end of December, there were 16 confirmed cases of the flu in our province, most of those in eastern Newfoundland. Now, flu vaccination clinics have ended, but the health authority says the vaccine is still available if you want to get the shot. And while we're not seeing an outbreak here elsewhere, the flu virus is hitting hard this season. And it's creating chaos in some hospitals. Thousands are sick and doctors say the numbers haven't peaked yet. 
Health reporter Christine Birak looks at why the season is just so bad. A glimpse into what it's like inside emergency rooms across the country this week. Waits are long, beds are full, and staff are scrambling to keep up. This is all I'm seeing these days is flu, flu, flu. We have so much flu. So we're heading into the lab, and um, this is where testing is done. So More than 11,000 cases of flu have been confirmed in Canada so far this season. It's not a pandemic, but it is unusual. Instead of a single flu virus sickening people, right now there are two. And one of them, H3N2, offers far more misery, especially for the elderly. We tend to see more severe seasons. We tend to see more outbreaks, more hospitalizations, and more deaths. When a virus like H3N2 gets into your system, its goal is to trick your cells into making copies of it. How sick you become usually depends on how long your immune system takes to recognize the invaders. If it's seen the virus before, it works quickly and you don't get sick. The flu shot tries to offer the immune system a preview of what to look for, but viruses mutate to avoid detection and... H3N2 tends to change a bit faster than other viruses. This year's flu vaccine should have protected people from H3N2, but the bits of virus that go into the shot are grown in eggs, and at some point in the process, it mutated. Still, experts say the flu shot offers some protection. There's emerging data to suggest that this might mitigate the severity of one's infection. So if you're going to get this sick from influenza, if you had the vaccine, maybe you'll only get this sick from influenza. Most people here would have opted for less sick. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. The Consumer Electronics Show is underway in Las Vegas. That's the annual showcase of products that promise to make your life easier and better and maybe even a bit more fun. And that is including some things that until now you never really knew that you actually needed. Kim Broomhuber gives us a tour. Are you tired of lugging your bags around the airport? Then why not buy a suitcase that will just follow you? Fed up with folding laundry, this robot will fold it for you. Just two among 50 football fields worth of new gadgets and gizmos here at the world's biggest electronics convention. How about virtual headphones? The system has a sensor that figures out where your ears are and beams the sound there. So if you move left, right, it will track you and other people will not be able to hear it. Then there's this cross between a Segway and a skateboard. I grew up in Calgary and snowboarding in the Rockies, and really that feeling of snowboarding on powder is what inspired this whole venture. Of course, there are the TVs, some rollable, and one so big it's been dubbed the wall. There's a washing machine that uses polymer beads and 80% less water, airbags to prevent hit breaks in seniors, and with the growth of voice-controlled speakers, you can talk to almost anything. The Internet of Things is starting to connect all of their devices, their thermostats, their door locks. That's huge. And this, a single-seat, three-wheeled electric car made in Vancouver, headed by a former race car driver. We have $4.3 billion worth of pre-orders for our vehicles right now. Most products aren't yet on the market. Many may never make it. And some still have kinks to work out, like that laundry folding robot. Turns out, it doesn't actually work. But in theory, it will, someday. And it'll only cost you $1,000. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Las Vegas. Hockey Canada unveiled the team that's going to defend the Olympic men's hockey gold medal at the Pyeongchang Winter Games next month. But players from the NHL won't be taking part this time. At the end of the day, these 25 men that are going to represent us are the right players. They've earned this spot. They're proud to be representing their country, and we're very proud of them because I feel that when we get to Pyeongchang, this team is going to make a lot of people proud. Now, even without the NHL contingent, the team is full of professional hockey players. Most of them play in leagues and places such as Russia, Germany, or Switzerland. Some of them are in the minors, and a few even have uh, some NHL experience. And, of course, disappointing news for uh, Teddy Purcell, who wasn't picked for the team. I did speak with his dad last week from Omsk in uh, Russia, and Teddy, unfortunately, had a bad leg injury. Uh, needed 10 to 20 days for uh, recovery, so his father knew it wasn't in the cards then. 
Hopefully we'll catch up with Teddy sometime down the road. Now in other news, the Royal Canadian Navy is making changes to appeal to younger recruits. As Murray Brewster reports, the goal is to reverse a shortage of sailors that's gone on for over a decade. Most of us in the civilian world take it for granted. The ability to pick up our phones, to FaceTime with family and friends, scroll the internet and even check social media. It is not something sailors in the Canadian Navy can do unless their ship is pulled alongside a dock where they can snag a signal. That is about to change. The commander of the Navy, Vice Admiral Ron Lloyd, says they're now installing Wi-Fi hotspots on warships. It was something that used to be strictly prohibited for security reasons, but no more. Like there are other navies that are operating with NATO that have Wi-Fi in far more spaces than we do. And like we're saying, no, you can't have it on board, period. That's crazy. The Canadian Navy is perpetually short of sailors. In fact, it is down 500 bodies in terms of regular strength. One reason is some sailors spend an extraordinary length of time away from home. They complete one deployment, come home, move to another ship, and are gone again. So the Navy says it is now tracking each sailor, and it wants to make sure no one spends more than 180 days away from home in any given year. The Navy recently asked pollsters what it takes to be attractive to millennials, and these course corrections are a big part of that. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. A Montreal priest is helping make life a little easier for the city's homeless with skill and dedication. He's a cobbler, and he's fixed countless pairs of boots and shoes over the past two decades, and then given them to those in need. Simon Nakanechi has our story. Jean-Pierre Couturier spends six days a week ministering to his parishioners' souls in Rivière-des-Prairies. On the seventh day, he heads downtown to attend to souls of a different kind. It's a day of my own, somehow, that I, that I spend for the others, but it's a, it's a special day of the week, yes. Couturier repairs shoes in the basement of one of Montreal's grandest places of worship, Mary Queen of the World Cathedral. Okay, here, here's the problem. He's largely self-taught. His tools are cobbled together, but year after year, he resurrects dozens of discarded pairs and gives them to those living on the street. You know, these guys are out. They walk a lot. It means that they're more freer. This man of the cloth started turning his attention to old leather 20 years ago. A homeless man came into the church, his tattered sneakers giving off a terrible stench. I had asked him to take his shoes off, his running shoes, actually. He's probably had them in his feet for a couple of weeks. And that's when I called the, the ambulance. They took him to the hospital and uh, they took care of his gangrena. So that was, that really was talking to me very much. Couturier gets the cast off shoes from nearby stores. Once they're fixed, he delivers them to volunteer organizations that serve the homeless. They go to La Maison du Père. Couturier says his humble labor has great spiritual rewards. Uh, Jesus himself has said uh, what you've done to the, to the smallest of these, and he doesn't only talk about children, but about those that are, that are uh, not so fortunate uh, as you've done it to me. So it's a great comfort to, uh, to have this, uh, this certainty that uh, you're, you're serving God. Simon Akineshny, CBC News, Montreal. All right, our viewer picture of the day. And this is going to be, I think, a tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, small community, uh, somewhere between, uh, let's say, eastern and central parts of Newfoundland. I'll narrow it down there. Population of less than 500. That's a toughie there, Snowden. Yeah. I know, I know. Okay, what about that mountain? What about that hill? Hmm. Think about it. And we'll have the answer Is after that the break. Clarenville? No, 500. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs>
and welcome back. Well, here is one way to dodge the winter weather travel delays. <laughs> By dog sled, Justin Allen is ready to embark on an epic trip home. He's taking his sled from Churchill, Manitoba to his hometown of St. John, New Brunswick. And that's a mere 3,200 kilometers, uh, probably take over eight to 10 weeks. Wow. Now granted, that's longer than a flight or a drive. Look at that route. Uh, but Alan is driven by a bigger mission. He says he wants to bring the dog sledding tradition to the East Coast, and his team is going to set off on Tuesday. Oh, beautiful dogs. Gorgeous. Good luck to them. They're moving. So here's a question for you. Is it too late to qualify for Pyeongchang? Depends on the event, right? <laughs> because this Virginia man could certainly be in the running for a <laughs> black ice skating no, no, medal. No, 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 oh. oh! That was... <laughs> He was on his way to his car when his slick driveway caught him off guard. And there he goes. So Almost had it. Yeah. <laughs> Almost had it. So the pirouette there, what do you give that, Ryan? 7.9. <laughs> I give him a solid 8.5 for that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, Can God. you imagine what was going through his mind when, <laughs> when that happened? Uh, they don't have boots. Apparently, he's okay. he must be okay Virginia. because his wife posted that on Facebook. That's Good thing right. he put the mailbox where he did or he might have kept yeah. on going. It's had 40 million yeah. views. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. She's mean. <laughs> <laughs> I think his rear end might be just as bruised as his ego after that. Uh, now have a look at uh, this beautiful picture. Uh, you were close in the Clarenville ish region uh, we go to Sunnyside uh -huh. uh, which uh, of course a beautiful area and a beautiful picture there and that is the full moon rising right around New Year's there Steve Barnes thank you very much for Gorgeous. sharing that on my Facebook page. it is a lovely one thanks again yeah. Steve then nice clear sky beautiful <laughs> that's our program thanks very much for being here have a great night good night see ya